Hello, welcome, and thanks so much for joining us for this event, Farming Smarter, Investing in Our Future. My name is Finn Locustain. I'm the Chief Executive of Farmwell and the producer of the Farmgate podcast. It's an absolute pleasure to be chairing this webinar for the Food, Farming and Countryside Commission and to be with you, with everyone who's joined us for what promises to be an extremely interesting hour of interviews and discussions. We have some fantastic state panelists. But before I introduce them, I just want to take a moment to talk about why we're here and then to set out the format and explain how you can take part. As we look forward towards November and this year's critical climate change conference, COP26, much attention will be centered on the global warming emergency. Governments seeking to tackle emissions often focus on the so-called low hanging fruit of energy, transport and housing. But there is another and that's soil. Soil is both a source and a sink for carbon emissions. And soil, well managed by farmers, has the potential to draw down and lock in vast amounts of carbon dioxide, allowing us to start reversing the effects of 250 years of fossil fuel pollution. When we hear about agriculture and climate change in the media, the context is nearly always negative. And just as there are fossil fuel hungry sources of energy and transport, just as there are poorly constructed and energy inefficient homes and buildings, there are without doubt fossil fuel heavy and inefficient systems of food production. But there are also renewable and regenerative ways to farm our land, production systems that reduce agriculture's global warming impact, that use sunlight and water efficiently and keep energy and nutrients cycling in the soil. These systems, agroecological systems, working in balance with nature, can produce good nutrition and good livelihoods for people everywhere. Agroecology provides solutions. The integration of food production with natural ecological earth systems is quite simply one of the best opportunities we have to avert catastrophe and to rebalance humanity's relationship with the natural world so that future generations can thrive. Today, at this event, we're focused on scaling up agroecological agriculture, and in particular, we'll be hearing about a big idea, an agroecology de development bank, to unlock finance and make funds available for investment into the multitude of small and medium-sized farm businesses that make up the economic ecosystem of food production in Britain. An agroecology development bank would speed our transition to fair and sustainable farming, filling the current gap in available finance, providing specialist expertise and developing a market for private agroecological finance. Well, in a moment, I'll introduce Sue Pritchard, the Chief Executive of the Food, Farming and Country. Countryside Commission, and then we'll hear from report co-author Tony Greenham, the FFCC's Research Associate for Finance uh, and Executive Director of Southwest Mutual. We're also joined by Sir Ian Cheshire, the Chair of the Food, Farming and Countryside Commission, and by Dame Caroline Mason, the Chief Executive of the Esme Fairburn Foundation. I'll ask them for their thoughts as part of a broader discussion, after which there'll be an opportunity for you to put your thoughts and questions to the panel. Talking of which, um, can I invite you to submit any questions you have using the Q&A function? Uh, our backstage team will pass them on to me later in the webinar, and you can also vote up other people's questions and we'll take that into account when we're selecting the ones that we ask. And if you'd like to tweet during the event, then please do, please use the hashtag Farming Smarter. And of course, you can also tag in the FFCC using the handle at FFC underscore commission. So without further ado, Sue Pritchard, this report is one of a series produced by the FFCC, setting out proposals for a transition to agroecology in the UK by 2030. Can you tell us more about why agroecology has become such an important focus for the Food, Farming and Countryside Commission and, and also you know, what's at the heart of this report into agroecological investment? Thanks, Finlow. So um, back in 2017, FFCC was set up to help shape a new vision for the future of UK food and farming, rural communities, rural economies, as we navigated our exit from the European Union. But of course, that was just one of the challenges facing the sector. We also needed to consider how to respond to the triple challenge of the climate, nature and public health crises. So we spent two years looking at the science, the latest research, holding workshops and roundtables with all sorts of different groups and organisations 
and, and we travel the country uh, on a bike to hear from people on farms, in communities and businesses right around the UK. And we learned that farmers want to be a force for change. We want to be part of the solution, mitigating and reversing global war warming, restoring biodiversity, restoring wildlife to the countryside and providing nutritious, affordable food for everyone. And we also learned that citizens want a fair transition, fair for people, fair for animals, for now and for future generations, where people who are taking most risk, often farmers and growers, are able to earn a decent living from their work and that citizens are not paying the price for the cheap food culture we've grown used to and which has had such a terrible impact on the planet in air, water and soil quality, crashing wildlife, wildlife numbers and and now spiraling diet related ill health, as, as well as perversely increasing food poverty in the UK. And we found that agroecology, the well established science and practice of applying ecological principles for a fairer and more sustainable food system, provides the best balance of solutions across these multiple challenges and that's why we made that recommendation in our 2019 report a transition to agroecology by 2030 with the right resources to support it but of course people quite rightly asked us then some valid questions can agroecology really work for the uk isn't it some kind of niche middle class interest can it really feed a growing population within planetary boundaries so we've already answered part of that question back in January with our Farming for Change report with Idri, the French think tank, and a little spoiler alert, the answer is yes. But perhaps the more urgent question right now, with so many changes confronting the sector, confronting farmers, not least the common agricultural policy reforms, is about where farmers can find the resources they need to help them make the transition. And that's the question that we're answering today in this great report co-authored for us by Tony and Duncan and Laurie. Thanks Sue, and you say uh, that it's a spoiler alert, I mean that doesn't mean that people shouldn't read it, that isn't, that isn't, <laughs> it, it, you crystallised it, but there's so much in that report, it's, it's a fascinating report. Thanks Sue. I'd like to turn to Tony Greenham. Tony, you're one of three authors on this report, along with Duncan McCann from the New Economics Foundation and economist Laurie McFarlane. Now, the idea of an agroecology development bank is, is exciting. It's precisely the sort of big socially and economically sound idea that politicians ought to be grabbing with both hands in the run up to COP26 in Glasgow. But part of the premise behind agroecology in the case that the FSCC has been making through the Farming Smarter Report series is that agroecology provides a sound business model. And I guess the question is, well, if the model is so sound, why do we need government intervention in the supply of finance? Thanks, Binlay. Yes, well, I should start by saying that there will be plenty of businesses transitioning to agroecology or already practicing it who can access the finance they need. But there's two reasons uh, <clears throat> why we should consider um, a government intervention behind this or that justifies it, if you like. I mean, the first, is that um, there are gaps, you know, and we'll come and talk about those, uh, we can um, unpack those in a bit more detail, but there are still plenty of circumstances in which businesses cannot access the finance they need to make the transition that they want to agroecology. Um, but there's a second, um, more ambitious reason, if you like, which is that we're not in a business as usual situation. I mean, in your, in your leading, you highlighted this very well. So here's an opportunity that we can grasp if we are bold enough, which is that agroecology, we can move with the grain of economics and business in the market, we've with that grain, but make sure that we move at the pace and scale that would enable us to um, forefront agroecology as one of our key solutions to getting to net zero. So that's point number one is, is that integration within our carbon targets and, and environmental. And the second part of the transition is about doing it in a way that's fair. So the uneven distribution of finance, both geographically and amongst different types of business and different types of farmer, is again something which uh, a, a sort of well-coordinated, well-managed 
Development Bank can address. So it's partly about identifying some gaps in existing provision and saying, well, we really should fill those. There's a sound, very well-worn economic rationale for doing that, which is a sort of market failure case. But then there's a mission-driven case that actually we need to go further than that. There's an opportunity to really make the most of this opportunity to achieve multiple public policy goals, which is why a public bank makes sense. So there you talked about uh, the challenge of scaling up, and, and I guess the implication of that is that there are, uh, there are barriers in place, and, and I guess those barriers are not just for farmers, but also for financial institutions. And I wonder if you could sort of highlight what those key barriers are that are faced by farmers when it comes to setting up or transitioning existing farm businesses to agroecological models, but also what the investment risks are for financial institutions, for lenders. Certainly. Well, in our research, we identified uh, four uh, broad sets of circumstances where uh, it's very difficult for farming enterprises to access the right finance. And that's not to lay any blame at the doors of existing finance providers. It's because of the way that finance is structured, particularly bank debt, which is the predominant form of finance in agriculture. It's not the only one, of course, but it's, it really does the heavy lifting. Right, that, that makes it difficult. So, so just run through quickly through them. The first is, is lack of security. So if you're unable to offer security for a bank loan, it, it increases the risk, it increases the cost, uh, it makes it more difficult for the bank to make that loan. And so, uh, and this, you know, there are a lot of tenant farmers, you know, a lot of, a lot of farming businesses don't own the land and don't own sufficient other collateral. It may be that they've had collateral, uh, collateral they have been able to use but they're about to go through a change in their farming methods, which may mean they not have, may not have the livestock that they used to or the equipment that they could put up. So that's one of the big barriers. The second is simply smaller farms. So, so here again, um, there's, there's often, a, it makes a lot more commercial sense for banks to target their efforts on, on larger deal sizes and larger loans, but you know, half of all farms in England are under 50 hectares. And quite often that's where a lot of um, agroecological practice innovation is, is happening, is in smaller farms too. So we mustn't miss those out. Thirdly, new entrants. So this could be brand new entrants or even succession. So it could be a um, younger generation taking over a family farm. A third of all holders are over retirement age, 65. And there's a, a recognized sort of succession challenge or slash opportunity, depending which way you look at it. And new entrants, of course, don't have a personal or management track record, which they can show to a lender or to a, you know investor, uh, which gives them the, the sort of data and the confidence they need to be able to invest. So that, that's the third gap. And then the, the final one actually is, is to do with the nature of what we're doing. So, you know, uh, there are finance providers, they're very used to lending against a certain business model. They've got, they've got data, they can analyze the credit risks of that very well. But when you're coming to them and saying, I'm gonna radically alter the way I'm gonna farm, right? There's, there's a complete lack of data there for the credit provider to be able to you know, underwrite against, if you like. So, and that's a real problem because what we need at the moment is, is and one of the joys of agroecology in a way is it puts the farmer back at the middle as being a knowledge worker, as being somebody who is best placed to understand how to get the best out of their land, you know, not just in food production, but biodiversity, carbon sequestration, you know, higher skilled jobs, even the whole package. So we want to be able to facilitate innovation, uh, but actually that's one of the most difficult things for banks to, fi to finance in this period of transition. Now in that report, which is a, which is a fantastic read, there's so much in there. Um, you say that the Agroecology Development Bank would be more than just a bank. And I think you've started to touch on it there, but I wonder if you can flesh it out a little bit more. What do you mean more than just a bank? Well, it's really important when, when looking at um, you know, new financial products that, that might be needed in a market, so the supply of finance, to also look at the demand for finance. Uh, so are the businesses that need that finance actually ready to take it? Are they in the best shape they could be? Um, and then uh, also you need to look at the underlying products that the business is in, the markets they're in. So you know, we, we have to see this in the context of what's actually happening in markets for food, and in land use, if you like, if you can call that a market, but other things which, were, which are happening out of land. And then we also need to look at um, the capacity building amongst farmers to make them uh, as you know, ready as they possibly can be to, to take the finance and use it really successfully. So the bank can't do all of that. 
And so it's impossible, it is really uh, important to see it as part of a system. But the bank, the bank can do and should do, we think, more than just be a, a supplier of financial products. And I think that one of the most important roles is around knowledge. So you talked about soil being key at the beginning of this. So acting in this institute that can work with other knowledge institutes, but really begin to develop high quality research and knowledge that's put out there into the market for free, you know, as public benefit. That's got to improve the working of markets. It's good for finance providers to understand what they're lending to and financing. It's good for farmers to understand what the knowledge is that's available for them. And then I think another area which is really important is advice and support for farmers for themse themselves. Interestingly, by the way, the, the, a lot of these arguments are, are familiar from um, a tackling shortages in small business finance. A lot of the same things crop up, but we're saying that a lot of those problems are, you know, even uh, loom larger in this particular sector of agriculture because of this big opportunity and transition that we're facing. So, yeah, so it needs to work in partnership. Uh, with other institutions in the space. And of course, I should emphasize that this is lending through existing banks. The Agroecology Agri Development Bank is not going to lend directly to farmers. It's going to work with existing, not just high street pro providers, but other finance institutions, uh, but also should work in partnership with, uh, with business advice um, and, and other support organizations. So farmers aren't going to get an ADB checkbook um, that they can use. Uh, um, so thanks very much, Tony. Uh, th those sort of two pillars, I guess, um, that you were talking through there can be kind of summarised as financial products and getting those financial products to uh, the right people and the right places. But then there's intelligence and information and advice that sort of build up that institutional knowledge um, and, and business knowledge as well, which is which is equally, equally important. Well, now that Sue and Tony have set out the context and the case there for an agroecology development bank. I'd like to bring on our other two panelists, Sirian Cheshire and Dame Caroline Mason. Sirian, if I could come to you first, you're chair of the Food Farming and Countryside Commission, but in the past you've been the non-executive chair of Barclays UK. I wonder if you could talk to us about um, agroecology and what it is that makes it more difficult for private financial institutions such as Barclays to invest in. Yeah. Well, Tony's um, conveniently stolen most of the points I was going to make, so <laughs> we'll have to add on to them. But, but from the perception of Barclays, which does, after all, bank 25% of the country's farmers and is, a, as Tony's also said, a critical partner for this future bank to reach the point of need, which is what, what we're trying to do. Um, I, I wouldn't underestimate the constraints that we operate under as, uh, as a mainstream bank, and particularly on regulation and capital requirements. So a lot of banking is set up on the basis of you run models of what businesses look like, how they perform, how they make their money, what the economic model is, and crucially, what's the history of losing money when you lend to a hotel, a bar, a farm. And the, the challenge for agroecology is that it is a semi-blank sheet of paper as far as the banks are concerned. So explaining how an agroforestry scheme might work, what are the mind the gap moments about the investment you have to make, when do you get your return, what are the risks, explaining how the interplay of some of these uh, different models within what even one farm works, and finally trying to grapple with the newness of the some of the potential income sources. So we're really encouraged to see things like Elms potentially start to deliver income streams to farmers in a way that wasn't possible under the, the old cap. And there may well be other schemes. You know, there's a lot, we said in the, in the um, uh, FFC report, there are so many other funding streams going into the countryside, you know, water catchment management payments, all sorts of other payments. If we could help bring together a picture of what's available farm by farm and a picture of farm by farm, how to plan to raise the value of the natural capital there and improve the quality of what's happening, then we can start to think about products in a very different way because you've got income sources that don't exist today. So an existing bank confronted with its regulator at the PRA saying, why are you taking risks lending to this? You basically get told that by the PRA, well, you have to hold a lot of capital, which then you have to charge for, therefore you lose money and you can't do it. So banking is currently by regulatory pressure defaulted towards lend on mortgages, i.e. land value, so as Tony says, no tenant farmers, and B, do overdraft financing from sort of crop plant to harvest type, smoothing the flows, which again is security driven. And what the ADB needs to do is provide products that allow you to think imaginatively 
about a farm business model with a new set of data and new sets of, as also Tony says, skills to make sure that that does come through. And what we're gonna do is gradually build up the understanding of how these models work. And eventually, I think this will become business as usual for the banks, but it's the mind the gap moment that we're in. Thanks very much for that. It's really interesting to hear about the, the constraints and the lack of flexibility that exists um, you know, for banks when they're making decisions about that and the importance of building that knowledge and, and understanding that you mentioned. Dame Caroline Mason, you're the Chief Executive at the Esme Fairburn Foundation. You're also Chair of the Investment Committee of the Environment Agency Pension Fund. From your perspective, what sort of institutional knowledge would an agroecology development bank need to build up in order to be successful, not just in getting finance to where it's needed, but also in providing that business support that's needed, the, uh, the advice for farmers? Um, Caroline, you're, uh, you're on mute, Caroline. I apologize. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, um, I want to use the example of Big Society Capital, actually, which was a sort of similar wholesaler um, into the sort of social, social space um, and, um, and was set up by, sorry, excuse me. <laughs> There's uh, sound effects in the background. There we go. Oh. <laughs> which was set up by government um, to look at social investment in this social enterprise space. Um, and and the, um, and to get social outcomes out of investment capital, and um, I would say how this differs and differs well um, is that um, there's a really clear mission and purpose. It's not a generalist green climate generalist sort of financing fund. It's got a real uh, it's got a um, a real sense of purpose and mission, and it is tackling a particular bit of that ecosystem um, and also um, I, I think what, so what it needs to have it, I believe is it has to stay really true to that that purpose and mission that will see its trade secondly the expertise so right from the start this needs to be co-designed with the practitioners on the ground uh, the mistake that big society capsule made was to uh, not have those, not have that expertise. So it was full of investment bankers um, who had no knowledge of the market, who didn't understand that these were small organisations, that they weren't investment ready. Um, and um, so it, it didn't, it was all about professionalising the social sector rather than socialising the investment sector and I think we have an opportunity here not to finance green but to greening about greening finance so actually um, to Ian's point that expertise and that knowledge can help de-risk these investments um, for the future so they're designed so we're testing and building up an understanding of the potential for these different types of um, products for the future um, supported by um, proper investment readiness support and I think there will be lots of partnerships to be built with this with organizations like Esme who want to see this ecosystem grow it understands the importance of, of farmers and farming in all of this so um, I think there's a huge potential here to not only sort out farming but to actually have a really strong influence on the way lending in general moves towards more purposeful you know models thank you thank you and of course just to mention to people that big society capital is of course an organization that you were previously uh, associated with as well yeah. and really interesting to hear what you say about that that need to co-design and yeah. you know just just having a co-designing in so many places in public life would would be would yeah. be a real step forward wouldn't it now ian you talked about the um the, the, essentially the mortgage model that um, a lot of private high street banks use um, in order to deliver their products. And I wonder if you think that a publicly owned agroecology development bank would be in a stronger position to serve agroecological farmers. And, and by that, I mean, for 
For example, would it be able to uh, better develop a range of financial products that were tailored uh, through that co-design process that Caroline mentioned to supporting new entrants and tenant farmers, for example? Yeah, I mean, I think the, there's no doubt there's um, a market gap. I, I mean, on one level, you could argue there isn't a market failure because there's a lot of lending to the agricultural sector. Mm. It's, it's structurally facing only in this way, which is security driven, um, which is to do a lot with regulation, I'm afraid. If, if you could start with a blank sheet of paper, and this is what I think is so interesting about this, is, is that you can think, A, about the difference of the customer types and the tenant farmers, I think it's 40% of all farmers. It's a really critical area where you need to design something differently, which is more cash flow and business plan based than security based. Mm. Um, but secondly, you've got huge variations in, you know, we talk glibly about, you know, agricultural business models. And if you're uh, growing, you know, vegetables in the, in the south of the country versus a hill farmer on, in Scotland or, you know, a, a, a Welsh, Welsh lamb, lamb farmer over there as Sue is, you've actually got to have a bottom-up driven approach and a locally driven uh, you know, approach as to what that business plan will look like and how then you finance it. Because if you just assume a one size fits all, this won't work. And that takes it into the, also the area I just touched on before, which is if you can start bringing in other income sources into this mix, which is will happen probably with Elms as the biggest thing, but there are lots of other payments floating around in the countryside that we need to think about in an integrated way and making sure it gets in there. And the danger at the moment is for administrative simplicity, a lot of the money ends up in the very big units because that's that's where banks and people can lend to. It's the scale point that's been made. If we could find through better technology and using data sets that would allow us with just automatic APIs to work out that that 50 acre farm is going to generate this amount of biodiversity and we can audit it in a way that means we can pay them for increasing natural capital. We can break through the current constraints of only lending to the really big units which are safe enough to lend to. So the whole point about this is customers, not one size fits all and integrate different forms of data and finance that we can recognize in, in these calculations. Thank you. Um, Tony, can I come back to you? And, and I'm interested in, uh, in what Ian was talking about there with that huge variance um, you know, that exists within agroecology, different farm sizes, different types, different products, different routes to market. Um, and, and I wonder if you can help us with a bit of a history lesson here. Because in the report, you say that the Agroecology Development Bank should be mission driven and publicly owned. So that's part of the question, I guess. But but really, how would this compare with um, with previous innovations that have aimed to crowd in finance for an economically viable but early stage sector? Sure. Well, there's, um, I suppose, one point to just make is that actually the case for uh, public development banks, I would say, is, is, is fairly well established now and there are many of them around the world and we examined that as part of this research, including 39 agriculture development banks. So the three areas which are traditionally um, seen as the, the being a case, I've mentioned one small business, another is, oh, and we have the British Business Bank in the UK, a second is infrastructure, and we're about to set one up, the UK Infrastructure Bank in the UK, and the third is agriculture. Uh, so I think we should have the full set. Now why? Um, well because uh, and how, how might it help in practice? So here we can look in the UK at the, uh, the, um, the, the Green Investment Bank and the role it played with offshore wind in particular, also bio, um, bioenergy, but particularly offshore wind, where um, it helped to build capacity, skills, um, you know, that data and that track record. Uh, as Ian said, you know, in banking, you, you need to have data to be able to assess what the credit losses are going to be, the regulator demands that of you. So uh, there was a lack of institutional expertise and skills really in what was a sector which on paper certainly made perfect economic sense as we argue that agroecology did, but it just lacked that history. So once uh, it had established that, it, it crowded in uh, you know, private finance and, and the banks all built that capacity. And in a sense, its job was done. It catalyzed the money into the sector. Now that's the, that's the similarity, the difference you've just pointed out because uh, there is no one size fits all, well, I mean, there are different sizes of wind farms undoubtedly, but the technology performs the same. Agroecology, one of the interesting and challenging things about it, I suppose, is this variation. It's about the complexity, it's about the multiple yields, it's about the, the location specific context. 
Uh, and so it may be that there'll be a role that's a sort of a longer term one for, for this institute. But I think essentially it's going to have to plug that gap in between what, you know, deposit funded banks, banks that are funded by people's savings are able to provide finance for and then what, what is needed out there. And, and so I think we can draw in, on these previous comparisons to show that that gap is can be bridged and that's kind of the point of them by these public development banks. So here, each... just in terms of those agricultural banks everywhere else in the world, we have an opportunity to do a next generation one because those are all funding old school agriculture, which is part of the problem. Ours is gonna fund the solution. Thanks, Tony. Thanks. So it's it's that building of institutional knowledge so that uh, the people working within the bank and the models and the systems they're using understand what it is they're talking about. And uh, uh, and that that sort of um, that that history lesson associated with green investment bank and wind, I think, is is a really interesting comparison. Caroline, just coming back to you, if I may, governance is going to be a hugely important uh, element in terms of the integrity of a new agroecology development bank and to shaping the funds and the products that it offers. And if the government were to move ahead with some form of ADB, then I wonder what sort of considerations they'll need to take into account in terms of getting the right balance between political representation and independent independent decision making? So I think it's really important that um, the, the bank can can have its own decision making. I think that's it, it I think it needs to be independent. However, I think it has to have a very strong, constructive, regular dialogue and relationship with government because um, changes, unexpected changes in government policy can have a really detrimental effect on the ground. So an example I would use would be um, community energy, which was absolute community owned energies, which was absolutely going really, really, really well. Lots of engagement, lots of involvement, people actually investing in it, making money, um, not huge amount, but you know, proper, proper, uh, you know, it was growing um, and um, the changes to FITs and subsidies more generally completely destroyed that. It just stopped it dead in its tra tracks in the space of three or four months. So um, because there wasn't that dialogue with government during, during the work on that policy to say, could there be an exemption from for community energy, which was doing work with fuel poverty, with, with housing associations. Um, so whilst it has to be independent, it has to have that very strong constructive um, relationship with government. And that balance will be, will be I think, it, it could be a huge opportunity. It will be challenging, but it's a huge opportunity. It sounds like it's so important to have that dialogue uh, because in so many ways that reduces the risk from the Treasury perspective, yeah. the public purse perspective, as well as from the, you know, the people on the ground uh, perspective as well. Uh, and, and in that way, it would make an ADB be much more robust um, uh, than that example that you gave of uh, uh, the change in policy on fits that, that undermined community energy in that way. I wonder about regulation and accountability more broadly, and I wonder what steps the bank could take to ensure that farm businesses that it invests in are genuinely committed to delivering the agroecological outcomes that, we, that, we, that we're hoping to see. Um, so in fact, we're currently working on a project with DEFRA and the Environment Agency precisely to test with farmers and utilities and to, to model and test where, the, where that risk and regulation element works. So that's at a very granular level, um, but I think on a on a more strategic level, you know, investors like stability. They like to know what the rules are. So again, I think a role for this bank could be to work with regulators um, in partnership to make sure that we're putting all this money in, but actually suddenly the regulation stops its dead stops it dead in its tracks. So. I, and I don't mean financial regulation, I mean environmental regulations. Um, so I think working in partnership um, and 
really closely with the regulators is going to be fundamental, I think. Thank you. Just turning, uh, Ian, finally to the political context, I suggested at the outset that soil and agroecological farm and land management are critical if we're to solve climate change while also addressing the crisis in biodiversity. And increasingly, the government is recognising the interconnectedness of these twin crises in nature. So big question, in your view, what should happen next? I mean, what should the government do? Is this an opportunity for the UK to show real leadership in Glasgow in November at COP26? Yeah, absolutely. And I think there are a couple of unique strands in this, which recognise that we're talking about generic themes in the in the work behind the scenes for COP, and I'm so slightly involved with that, which is to do with what are the attributes that the UK can really talk about. And the mm -hmm. double themes are nature-based solutions and finance, because that's obviously clearly a UK yeah. world-leading capability. And the fact that the ADB would bring this together is, is absolutely the win-win that I think the frankly, the government wants and needs to be able to announce at COP to demonstrate where Britain is going to lead, as well as by convening other people to maybe do this elsewhere. And to build on Tony's point, when we've looked around in this um, excellent report, um, there are lots of agricultural banks, there are lots of development banks, but actually there isn't an agroecology development bank. And this would be a brand new bit of innovation in this space where we can understand why it doesn't exist and what it might do to fill the void to make this transition happen. So this is a absolutely classic example where government can create the conditions for success, the private sector will get involved. That doesn't, this is not about a freebie from the taxpayer uh, subsidizing some sort of spendthrift farmer or something. This is really genuinely mobilizing the government's balance sheet to ensure that the maximum public good can come from this transition in the, in, the, in the model of agriculture in the UK. So to my mind, it's an absolute no brainer for, for COP26 and the sooner we can announce it, the better. Fantastic, well, I hope the government's listening. Thank you, Ian, and thank you everyone uh, for taking part in that panel discussion. This is clearly such an important subject and I can see um, that there are a huge number of questions. I'm afraid we're not gonna get through all of them. Um, and I'm going to put on my reading glasses to help me out here because it's your turn. Um, uh, let's have a look. I've got, I've, and these have been fed through by WhatsApp uh, to my phone. So the question for Caroline, these same conversations and uh, the same elements, knowledge, advice, brokerage, are also taking place around biodiversity, net gain, carbon mm -hmm. and other nature based solutions at the moment. How can financing vehicles bring about um, integrated solutions? Uh, with it's hard, actually. Um, and we, as I said, we're piloting four of these around the country um, because um, there, are, there are lots of stakeholders. There are lots of expectations. We need to find out who's prepared to pay for what. As Ian said, there are different, different ways of paying for these things, which are all new. Um, but that's why it's really important that we start this and we start really from a practitioner's point of view, from the ground up and we build that knowledge and we build that data set and we, and we uh, um, really um, look at how it will work and discover the barriers, discover the risks and then work towards how those can be mitigated and, um, but, I think it has to be from the ground up. There isn't a one size fits all. And actually it will take a bit of time, um, but it's, it's too important not to do it. Thank you. Question here for Tony. Um, are there lessons that we can take from the developing world, e.g. microfinance and accessing uh, new and more difficult lending markets? The evidence from those schemes seems to suggest that lending is less risky than anticipated. Mm. Yeah, I think we can take some lessons from that. I mean, in essence, this is um, the limitations of there being, um, you know, an over-reliance on one type of way of assessing credit risk. Uh, and to an extent, uh, you know, Ian's right that, that, that for various reasons, you know, that there is a sort of standardization that sort of by design or otherwise has emerged perhaps in, in credit for agriculture, which 
which is leaving you know, all these untouched areas. So, and that was a, a similar problem with microfinance. You needed a different model and you needed different products to unlock that. And I think there is a bit of a comparison there actually. And at the end of the day, it wasn't saying, the reason why that lending wasn't happening was that it was unsuitable, you know, it was unbankable uh, or that it was too risky. It's just, we hadn't yet found the right model and structure to be able to bank it. And, and it actually it wasn't that it was too risky. Thanks. So, Here's a big one. How would food prices change under a transition to agroecology? It is a big question. And, uh, and the sorts of changes that we're talking about um, in our work, in the Farming Smarter report and in the Farming Change report um, I referred to earlier, are being picked up by all sorts of organisations um, and countries around the world. So we know there are huge changes in front of us for climate, for nature, for health and well-being, which have by and large been brought about by the attachment to a cheap food culture. But the cost of that cheap food has been passed off elsewhere in the system, the cost of the environment and to public health and well-being. Massive rise in diet related ill health is, is testament to that. So we need to work on a number of fronts and agroecology is just one of those fronts. We also need to work on um, the, the effects of a overly commodified global food system. Um, and uh, we were talking about COP26 just a few moments ago. There's another global um, meeting happening this year, um, starts in Rome, finishes in New York, the United Nations Food Systems Summit. And just this week, rapporteurs for the United, food Systems, um, United Nations Food Systems Summit has called for agroecology to become the paradigm for a more sustainable and fairer food system because it starts to pick up on all of those interconnected and interdependent issues of which food prices is just one. So um, if we were to just introduce agroecology without tackling any of those other big systems issues and probably food prices would go up because currently they are probably too cheap because the, the price is paid elsewhere but we also know we have to tackle those other interconnected issues and it's not just us in the UK that are concerned about that it's countries all around the world. It's interesting. One of one of the the ways that that I've always sort of thought about it is the price of of some food products is likely to rise, but the cost of the shopping basket. We need to find ways to help that kind of stay the same, so the cost of meals doesn't increase too much. But it's just different things that we might eat. Well, segueing from that neatly, um, Ian, I wonder if you can tackle this one, which is which is not unrelated, which is. Where do supermarkets sit in all of this? They wield huge power um, as they are the main contact with the consumer. And at the end of the day, most food is sold through them. If they continue to push buy one, get one free deals or buy one, get 20 free, I mean, it's, it's too ridiculous at times, uh, then the push for cheaper foods, aren't they risking undermining everyone's hard work to produce nutrient dense food produced with the environment in mind? No, I actually believe that the supermarkets are a crucial part of the solution to this. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of our commissioners, Judith Batchelor, you know, comes from Sainsbury's and is very engaged. We've had lots of support from you know people like Waitrose and Co-op and, and others. And, and there is no doubt that the supermarkets understand they have a, a really central role to play. The, the two points I'd make on it, one is that they're looking for solutions. So we need to find ways of helping them plug their supply chain into better quality food production. And the second is that a lot of the food sort of changes we're talking about affecting the input prices of food. And actually that is fairly tiny based on the total cost that the consumer ends up paying. And if we could unlock some of the benefits, um, you know, Sue, for example, you know, reference the diet, cost of diet. If we can spend over 15 billion in the NHS treating diabetes. Mm. Can we take some of that public money back into the system and find a way of making the, the trade-off less extreme? Because at the moment you get cheap here, very expensive society over here. And there needs to be a reframing and actually the supermarkets might be a great way to do that because they've got the scale with which to do it so i think they've got to be part of the solution and in in, in having speaking as an ex-retailer I, I actually think they're super aware that they've got an issue on their hands and we need to help provide constructive solutions that's good news can, can i can i add something please, to please. that yeah. um just to say i completely agree with that and um iceland tesco's sainsbury's they they are all super aware that 
things need to change. But secondly, we've got 8.4 million people in the UK currently living in food poverty. So the current system just is not working. We, we need fundamental, fundamental overhaul of, of, of the system, not just for environmental reasons, but for health reasons and for, and for sheer poverty reasons. Thank you. We've got time probably just for one or two more questions um, and, and none of them can have super speedy answers, but let's see how we can do it. Um, Tony, how can we address the need for the provision of these multiple benefits being reflected in land value? Well, in a way, we might not want them to be. <laughs> uh, I mean, one, one of the challenges actually for the sector has been rising land values driven by things other than the value for producing food and other and other use, you know, other yields. So um, actually, this does point to another important piece of the Commission's work, which is around a land use framework for the UK, mm. where we can make sure that you don't get sort of money flowing into to, to buying land for, for, you know, one use or another in a way that's completely uncoordinated and doesn't take a look at what the country as a whole actually needs. Mm. That's a real live issue. It's a little bit outside of the scope of, of this report to solve, but um, we're definitely working on that one. <laughs> Thanks. I'm going to have a final question here for Ian. Um, how will the bank work with wider public subsidy schemes and perhaps even the potential rise of new private markets such as carbon credits to avoid overfinancing agriculture and inflating agriculture? Gosh, I imagine most of the agriculture world will be thrilled to the idea of money flooding into it. So that'd be a high quality problem to be dealing with. But I think the reality is, you know, building what, what Caroline has been talking about, is that there's, there needs to be some integration about the broader other aspects of government policy and, and, and where public funds are being deployed for different things. And one of the striking you know, experiences we had when we wrote the report was just how much money there was in piecemeal fashion. And it wasn't being thought through, as Tony said, for the land use strategy of mind. And therefore, the, you know, the problem is, is, is not so much, you know, absolutely lack of money going into, in fact, even agriculture, it's just not necessarily going the right place, the right way with the right join ups. Yeah. So I would hope that one of the things that the bank could provide in conjunction with, you know, research and, and, and skills based agencies is an overview which says right here is the total systemic pot of money and these are the outcomes it's having and as Tony says not ending up um, inadvertently you know arguably through things like inheritance tax relief subsidizing you know land values to a point which is not connected to the mm -hmm. systemic benefits for health and, and public well-being and the environment and I think this this is the sort of really step back moment and say if we can bring all that together and identify at a local level the flows of money, we can then tailor the farm by farm solution because that's ultimately what we've got to get to. Thank you. I'm going to take one more question and it's dangerous because I'm not going to field it to anybody in particular. I'm just going to see who can take it uh, and, and see if we could just have a 20 second answer really. Does anybody know what the government thinks about this idea? Are they interested in the idea of an agroecological development bank? <laughs> I would say that they're interested, but they don't know yeah. what it is yet. And so yeah. one of the points about this report, and we, we got good feedback, I think it's fair to say, Sue, from the original report. This is a way of trying to help flesh them, uh, flesh out that idea and talk about the next step. So, but as Tony said, they have created an infrastructure bank, and it's not like there isn't money for investment in infrastructure. <laughs> they created a business bank. Uh, we've got, I think, a real logic for helping recover from COVID better. Mm -hmm with more intelligent, joined up government thinking. Brilliant, wonderful. Um, I've been asked to say there are lots of questions from the audience. Um, could I tell people, uh, and I am, uh, we will share the Q&A after the event to pick up any questions that we didn't get to. Okay, so we'll, we'll do our best with that. Um, we're, it's nearly all we've got time for, but before we finish, Stu Richard, can I come back to you? And I just wonder if you have any reflections on everything that we've heard and discussed. There's been so much um, uh, that, that you've heard today. There are fabulous questions and comments in the chat too, which we will come back to. I mean, what, what we're talking about here is whole systems change. We're talking about changing a global food and farming system, not just us in the UK, but other countries, other businesses around the world. And we know that there are lots of leaders in business who are also um, working on this very, very same challenge. What the agroecology 
development bank does is just answer that question that often gets thrown into the mix this is all very well people say but where's the money where is the resources to help make this happen so in thinking about how we change the whole system we're providing the the the, the, the route map for a way of shifting the system by directing the resources that farmers want and need to be part of that solution to be a force for change for climate for nature for health and well-being and we think it is really really exciting we're looking forward to hearing as you say Finlo, what government has to say fantastic and i think it, it, one of the things that you were sort of basically saying there is that it, you know that there has to be a sort of a big movement government needs to needs to take action it needs to look at the way that it regulates and make sure that there that there is the finance that's available and then it's it's about having this this grand partnership isn't it with mm -hmm. you know between people on the ground farmers um and uh, and consumers or customers but also with uh you know the big retailers as well as uh, as, as those smaller retailers and and right the way through uh, the, the supply chain, making sure there's innovation there. And so that's what really is at the crux of this. It's about helping to finance and empower that, uh, that change. So thanks, Sue, and thanks, everyone. Um, we're coming to the end of our time. This year, as I said before, you know, with COP26 ahead, there's an understandable temptation to focus hard on climate change. But the dramatic loss of biodiversity is equally important. And we need to ensure that our climate solutions are integrated with the restoration of biodiversity wherever possible. And agroecology provides a triple solution, at least a triple solution, good food, climate mitigation and nature restoration. And I've realized, you know, that there's there's a fourth, which is which is health, uh, better health outcomes as well. And by integrating food production with natural ecological earth systems, we have the chance to rebalance that all important relationship we have with the natural world. And across Britain, you know, this is the good news, across Britain and indeed around the world, more and more farmers are turning to agroecology. But as we've heard, finance is a fundamental barrier to many of those that want to make that transition. An investment is needed in farm businesses and in the processing and retail infrastructure required to bring agroecological farm products to market. But we also need to invest in knowledge so that those working in the financial services understand how to assess agroecological opportunity and how to measure positive land management outcomes in order that they're able to lend to target funding appropriately and provide sound business advice. An agroecology development bank as proposed this evening by the Food, Farming and Countryside Commission, seems to me to offer a bold and intelligent and entirely viable solution to the investment challenge. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this event. Please visit ffcc.co.uk and follow the links to read the full report, Farming Smarter, Investing in Our Future, and other reports in the Farming Smarter series. And please take a moment to subscribe to the FarmGate podcast, which you can find at faifarms.com forward slash podcasts, or just search for FarmGate wherever you subscribe to your podcasts. I'd like to thank today's panellists, Sue Pritchard, the Chief Executive of the Food, Farming and Countryside Commission, Tony Greenham, report co-author for the FFCC and Executive Director of Southwest Mutual, Sir Ian Cheshire, Chair of the FFCC, and Dame Caroline Mason, Chief Executive of the Esme Fairburn Foundation. And of course, thank you for tuning in, for joining in, and for being with us this evening. I've been Finlow Castain. Bye for now. <laughs>